William of Ockham is a medieval philosopher. You can see the dates there, 1280 to 1349. And in part one here, we're going to look at what he is best known for, Ockham's razor, and then apply that to his take on universals, as well as uh, cover a couple other topics that he discusses. So first of all, Occam's razor, the way he initially puts it is that it is pointless to do with more what can be done with less. You don't want to add things when you can get by with fewer things. So another way of saying this, uh, a variant on this, is do not multiply entities beyond what is necessary. That may be the form that you have heard Occam's razor before, if you have heard it. Or there is a contemporary colloquial corollary, and that is keep it simple, stupid. The, the, the idea, I'm jesting a little bit there, obviously that's not a technical uh, process to follow, but parsimony is a value that Occam has, and it has turned out to be a good value as a general principle to apply in many different areas. And so let's consider an application or maybe even an implication. And for Occam, recall, of course, for medieval philosophers, they are greatly influenced by Aristotle, very much in the shadow of Aristotle. And Occam uh, does not consider motion to be something of a different kind of thing from objects and place. So Aristotle in his categories talked about 10 different kinds of things that exist. Um, action and affection were two of those, which might include uh, motion as we think about them, um, other aspects. So motion was often considered to be a thing in itself that exists uh, distinct from objects, distinct from places. But Occam denied that. And he had an argument. He says, if motion were a thing in itself, something that actually is existent, a kind of being, then it would be either simple or composite. So that seems to be a, a necessary truth if something exists, that it's either simple or composite. And then he just sets up the, follows through with the dilemma showing that neither one is plausible. If it's simple, it would not differ from instantaneous change. And of course, instantaneous change is not motion. But motion has to occur over time. So it can't be simple. So we rule out that possibility. So we need to explore the other possibility of it being composite. Well, if it's composite, that means it has parts. And if it has parts, they either exist at once or they do not. So you have two options, either all the parts exist at the same time or they don't. Well, they can't exist at once at the same time for that's against the character of motion, right? It needs to be again, extended over time. Uh, but they cannot exist at different times for a composite things thing by definition has various parts at the same time. That's what it means to be composite. So neither option there makes sense. So that means motion cannot be composite. Well, if it can't be simple and it can't be composite, then there is no thing, no substance, no existent that is motion. So that's how we argue against motion, according to Akka. Now, moving on to the view on universal, something that he is, uh, again, after Occam's razor, one of his most famous uh, writings is, is on the topic of universals. And he's considered often as the founder of the position of nominalism. So this is a view on universal. Um, so the idea of universals, of course, um, 
you have a universal concept of a cat. And that means that every cat participates in the form of cat. You would say it that way if you're platonic. But even if you were Aristotelian, Aristotle also talks about the universal cat. It is a kind that exists. So only for nominalism, though, only the name is common to all things called by one name. There's really no substantive thing apart from that. It's just language. So there are no universals that exist separate from the individuals, not in the platonic sense, clearly, but even not in the Aristotelian sense. Are there universals that exist that we can even conceptually separate from the individual substances that exist? So there's no thing that the individuals participate in, and by that thing, that universal, are the kind of thing that they are. And again, this is applying to uh, however you uh, think of universals, and obviously there are various positions even if one affirms that universals exist, you could take the Platonic route, you could take the Aristotelian route, and he is rejecting both of those. And so there is no universal rabbitness, you know, or rabbitaity that all rabbits share, that there is no such thing as a universal in any form. So that is the position. That's the view of nominalism. Now, why does he think that? He provides at least three arguments, three that I will cover here. And so for the first argument, fairly uh, direct and simple, nothing which is one in number, that is a universal. So there's just one universal. If there were one for a rabbit, that would be rabbitness or rabbitaity. There would just be one in number, but nothing which is one in number can exist in many singulars. So if it did, it's multiplied and you don't have one anymore, you have several. So it's no longer one in number. So it's incoherent that there would be universals. Okay, so that's one argument, there are no universals. Let's explore a second one. An individual of any species can be created afresh. That is, created in the fullest sense of the word, created ex nihilo, if you like, regardless of how many others of that species exist. So, uh, it doesn't matter if there are a million or a hundred or just one other things that exist of the same species. You could always create a new individual out of nothing. It would be the idea. And uh, Occam would be a theist. And so creation ex nihilo is the kind of creation uh, that God does. So that's what he has in mind here. Creation is from nothing by definition. That's what he means in the fullest sense of word to be created. So if you have an individual that can be created afresh out of nothing, then nothing essential in it has to exist prior to the individual's existence. Nothing essential in the individual would have existed prior to the individual's existence. Well, that means there's no universal belonging to the essence of a thing prior to its existence. You don't have that. Now, you might take this kind of rationale and uh, let it be uh, an argument for the kind of existentialism that Sartre endorsed, but we don't need to pursue that. The third argument, any particular thing could be entirely annihilated. So taking the other direction from the second argument, any individual thing, particular thing, could be entirely annihilated without the annihilation of the others of the same species. So if you have uh, many, many rabbits and you just entirely annihilate one rabbit, you don't, it does not affect 
the existence of the other rabbits. Well, that means there's nothing, there's no existent thing that's common to each particular of a species. If you had eliminated that thing, it would no longer exist and you wouldn't have no longer uh, have individuals of that species. So we conclude there are no universals. So he has those three different arguments to conclude that there aren't any universals of any kind. And so we have uh, nominalism. Now, if you want to get a little bit particular here, is it really nominalism? Is it, is it the name, the, the linguistic entity that's significant? Or should we call this view conceptualism? So instead of a universal, there's this term, apple, let's say, that applies to many different individual apples. And that's technically what the nominalist view is. All we have is the term apple, right? But technically, again, Occam is probably best understood as a conceptualist. It's not the term, it's not the word apple that's the most significant thing that we should be concerned about but rather it's the concept of the apple that we have in our minds. And so, you know, maybe this is a, a chasing a, a, a threat line of thought that isn't that significant uh, to distinguish conceptualism with nominalism, but uh, I think it's worth considering at least. It's not the name, right? So we have a concept of an apple that applies to all apples. And so it's not the word that's important. It's not the term that's important. So, and, and we can understand that point by recognizing that the same concept might be expressed by various terms. So we say the apple in English or la palme in French or la manzana in Spanish, right? Uh, it's the same concept, but the term actually varies. So it's not the the name or the term that's significant, it's the concept. Now, one more thing that I'll mention in this video before we uh, transition in the second part, we're gonna take up Occam's ethics. Uh, and that is what he has to say about philosophy of language. Just a, an interesting point here that he provides a clarification of the, what we call the use and mention distinction the distinction between using a word and mentioning the word. Now, we philosophers today have a tool to do that. We put single quotes or sometimes called scare quotes around the word when we are merely mentioning the word and not using it. So uh, to clarify this, uh, two sentences here, an onomatopoeia is easy to say. So boom, whoosh. Hiss. Those are onomatopoeias. Um, they are very easy to say. Uh, that's, we're using the word in the sentence, right? That, that word onomatopoeia is being used in the sentence. But we could just mention the word and we might say it this way, onomatopoeia is not easy to say, right? So when we're mentioning it, it looks like we have contrasting or contradictory sentences. But with the scare quotes, right, we're referring to the word itself uh, being a, not easy to say, unlike onomatopoeia themselves, which are easy to say. So that is an important distinction to help clarify uh, sometimes uh, ambiguities in language and arguments to clarify what's going on in a discussion uh, to make sure there's not a flaw in reasoning um, by uh, making that mistake of ambiguity there. So he also goes on, one other thing in philosophy of language, he describes the function of common nouns uh, so that they don't imply the existence of universals. Obviously, since he doesn't think universals exist, he would not want a view of nouns that would imply that there are universals. So he, he goes on and, and does that as well. So like I mentioned, this is a, a, a complete uh, topic on its own, but 
If you want to know more about Occam, we will have a video on Occam's ethics.